Okay, good afternoon from my side as well. And, and uh, I'm going to look at the challenges from a bit, uh, bit different perspective, uh, looking more uh, on, on the other uh, possible approaches to, to solving the, the uh, challenges in the, in the grid, especially looking at uh, uh, smart grid uh, umbrella and, and what are the uh, alternative uh, solutions that this uh, approach would, would bring to the system. Okay, so what is really the challenge uh, for the system? It's, it's coming from the political uh, perspective and from, from the goals that we have set for the electricity and power sector. So providing uh, uh, affordable, uh, green, and, and at the same time secure uh, electricity. Uh, this is of course at the same time with, with the restructuring of the industry splitted uh, responsibilities, etc. So, so then uh, we need to understand that, that the political goals will have a uh, broad uh, impact on, on the issues in the sector. So, so for example, renewable energy will affect the conventional power generation in terms of lower running hours, etc. So what is really the challenge in Europe? Uh, once we have decided to put a lot of wind in the system, uh, there is going to be a lot of variation uh, in the actual demand for, for dispatchable power plants. So that's of course a good thing for, uh, for the type of generation capacity that we provide. But what else could solve this, uh, this thing? So if we, if we go through things that are under the umbrella of, of smart grids, uh, different different things, then, then we can rule out many of those uh, from the societal point of view. So it doesn't meet the three goals of, of the power system. Or then we can rule out certain things because they don't make a business case for the, for the utilities. So if we start with, with those uh, solutions that we can uh, put under the smart grid umbrella, uh, first of all, uh, there are suggestions that we could solve things with the with, uh, building so-called supergrid or a lot of uh, interconnection uh, capacity. Well, this is needed to, to transport offshore wind and other, uh, other remote locations uh, to where the consumption is, but it doesn't really solve the fluctuation in the, in the, in the uh, wind supply. So yes, we need more grids, but it's not uh, solving the balancing issue. Uh, storage uh, technologies then. Um, as Jakob Klimstra has uh, analyzed in, in his very nice book, uh, storage, except for pump hydro, is not really feasible from, from the economic point of view. So, so taking into account uh, the round trip efficiency and, and uh, the cost of these solutions, it doesn't really fulfill the requirements of the system. It doesn't solve the problem. Uh, what about then demand response, which is uh, probably the primary promise uh, from, the, from the smart grid side? Uh, yes, it looks actually one of the most promising things uh, in the, in the on the list. And, and let's have a, a bit, bit closer look at, at that as well. Uh, but the, the challenge probably here is that you have fairly limited time uh, for the for the time period when, when the consumers are willing to, to cut off their uh, demand. So that's, that's the limiting factor in, in demand response. Okay, uh, wind spilling then. Uh, well, yes, uh, smarter uh, wind power is also needed and, and uh, including all the uh, peaks in, in, in wind power generation in the system is going to be very costly. So cutting certain certain part of the peak without losing too much of the energy produced by that uh, is, is a helpful thing, but again, it doesn't solve the whole thing. So there is clearly a, a need for what we could call smart power generation. So flexible uh, generation capacity based on uh, gas fuel in, in practice. So what do we mean with smart power generation? Uh, so it's a concept where we, we uh, try to, uh, to characterize the, the 
uh, features of the type of capacity that would uh, survive in the, in the new environment with a lot of uh, intermittent uh, uh, wind power generation and, and, and solar generation. So that means uh, it has to be flexible in operation, quick start, quick stop. Uh, Niklas, uh, in the previous presentation, already, already uh, addressed those technical uh, capabilities that we have. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our view on, on, on the type of capacity that is needed in the, in the future systems. Uh, of course, other types of technology like especially hydro can fulfill many of these, but unfortunately that's not available. Uh, we can't increase the hydro capacity to meet the, meet the uh, challenges in the future when, when there's more and more wind in the system. Okay, uh, if we then, if, if from the societal point of view, the uh, demand response and smart power generation look as the, as the most promising uh, cases under the uh, smart grid umbrella, uh, what is then the business case for the utilities? Uh, if, we, if we assume that the current system is going to stay as it is, uh, then uh, there is no uh, room for demand response to, to I mean, large extent in the European market. Uh, so then this would put a lot of uh, pressure on the conventional generation which means then uh, a lot of price fluctuation, price volatility in the market, a lot of uh, uh, fatigue and creep on, on, on combined cycle technology, etc. But uh, if we look at the business case uh, from, a, from a utility point of view, it might not be that bad, uh, although it's, it's going to be a risky business, but the, the price uh, of, the, of, of the electricity in the peak hours when, when there is no uh, hydro capacity uh, and, and no wind capacity, no solar capacity available, it's going to be fairly high. Uh, for example, Pöyry has, has done a study on Northwest Europe on the prices and, and it actually pretty good, pretty well matches the type of, of uh, production costs and, and uh, overall cost that our technology has. So it might not be that bad business case for the utilities. But uh, from a societal point of view, not necessarily uh, the, the best case. Uh, so here we see some of the price curves that, that Pöyry has uh, simulated for the future. So we see that uh, on, the, on the left here we have the current situation. And when we move to the future and more and more intermittent renewables come in, uh, we have more and more hours with, with high prices, both the extreme high and then in the, in the middle of the range, uh, up to 50% of the time, we have clearly higher prices than, than what we have at the moment. So it's not, it might not be the most uh, nicest case for the, for the consumer who is going to pay the, pay the bill. Uh, if we look at the competing technologies here, open cycle gas turbines, uh, our gas engines, uh, and, and combined cycle gas turbines, we see that our technology is, is fairly competitive in a broad range of running hours, starting roughly from, from 500 hours a year to, to roughly 4,000 running hours a year. So then that's, that's the range where our technology is, is the uh, most flexible and, and also cost-wise uh, good solution for, for solving the, the challenge. Uh, what about then the, uh, the demand response uh, in, the, in the picture? So in the previous picture, the, the uh, framework uh, and, and the market structures, et cetera, didn't support, uh, support demand response. What if this is going to be promoted in, in Europe as well as it is in, in US at the moment? Uh, then the question is, what is the business logic for, for utilities? And there might well be uh, some, and uh, integrating a lot of, uh, lot of loads uh, uh, managing this uh, distributed power generation, etc. So that's, that might be a very cost-efficient solution. Uh, but if we look at the figures uh, and, and what we get the data from, from the US, uh, we see that demand response doesn't really so, uh, bring very cheap capacity in the market. The investment per uh, kilowatt is in the same range uh, than then what you have, the fixed cost per kilowatt is the same range as what you have for peaking capacity. But the challenge is here that, that uh, typically you are not able to use those demand response um, uh, kilowatts and megawatts 
for a very long period. For example, in the PJM market, you, you can use this demand response capacity up to 60 hours a year. Uh, so, so 10 times 6 hours, uh, which makes this actually pretty expensive per megawatt hour uh, contributed to the system. So it's more about the very extreme peaks where this is going to uh, be part of the picture. Uh, cutting some of the very highest peak uh, hours of, of, the, of the price, uh, but not really solving the, the large bulk of intermediate uh, power generation need that where, where our technology is at, at its best. So uh, I would conclude that there is, in, in the smart power generation picture, room for, for demand response also, uh, and, and that, that would be then integral part of the of, of smart grid solutions okay that's uh, that's the brief summary of what, what what we've been thinking around the smart grid uh, side uh, what, what we how we see the f way forward here is that uh, we would also first of all need to understand a bit better what, what is the real challenge in each system uh, then we need to understand what is the what are, what are the technical uh, ways of, of solving the challenges. Uh, we, we start to have this, these two stages very well uh, in place in, in Europe. Uh, what is then uh, the challenging part where the, the vision is still quite blurry is the, uh, are the policies that would be needed in, in, uh, for creating uh, the capacities and, and putting the technical solutions in, in place. So then, uh, so that the utilities could react uh, to these, these uh, policies and make a business case for themselves. Okay, so that's, uh, that's very good. If you want to read more on, on, the, on the solutions uh, well, that, that are alternative, please have a look at our, uh, the, the book that we have, sp have sponsored that was published yesterday. And, and uh, please, uh, if you have questions, come and, and discuss this. Thank you.